good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Stuart Miniker. I'm a family doctor here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation Los Gatos Center. I'm here today with KCA TV and Health Connections. We're going to have a conversation with my colleagues about cold and flu. Please join me as we meet them here in their office. Good morning. Nice to see you guys. So let me introduce Dr. Monica Weimer, a pediatrician here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation, and Dr. Panos Dinopoulos, an internal medicine specialist. Well, so Monica, everybody loves kids. So let's start with you. Would you please tell us a little bit about what you look for or what parents should look for in the cold season for their children? Yeah, so it's really common for children to get colds uh, during the winter time. Um, most often those are due to respiratory viruses that are very common in the community. So some common symptoms that parents may notice in their child might be nasal congestion, runny nose. Um, child may have cough uh, or even fever. Um, sometimes children may have low energy as well or may not want to eat or drink like normal. Are there any things that worry you when you see in children's behavior about uh, their colds? Absolutely. So some of these things are specific to the age of the child, but in general the things that I want, ask parents to watch out for would be to make sure their child can keep well hydrated. So often that means taking small quantities of fluid more frequently. That can be water, tea, sometimes even hydration fluids that you can buy at the store, like Pedialyte or Enfilite. Um, the other thing is to watch the child's breathing. Um, particularly if children have cough, um, things I ask parents to watch out for is very rapid breathing or breathing with a lot of effort. And if parents have any question about, you know, about their child's breathing, to bring them into the pediatrician to check. Great. Are there other reasons parents should definitely bring the child in or make a call to the pediatrician or family doctor's office? Um, generally, I say that fevers are pretty normal with viral infections, with colds. Um, but especially if the fever is over 104 degrees and the parent is worried that the child is having a hard time keeping down liquids, then I would say that would be an important reason to come in. Panos, you yes. take care of adults. And can you tell us a little bit about how cold care at home and uh, how we decide when to come to the office is different for adults with colds. Absolutely. So adults and kids mostly get similar symptoms. Um, the big thing to look for and to, you know, treating something like the, the viral cold, uh, a lot of rest, a lot of fluids. Uh, you want different medications, uh, whether it be acetaminophen, Advil, something to bring down the fever because typically you do have a little bit of a fever that comes with it as well. Um, but mainly that's, that's the main thing, just rest and hydration is what I would say. So it sounds like worries or decisions we have to make about when to see the doctor for adults and children are similar. How about Panos, uh, how do we know if it's a flu that's a little bit more dangerous than a regular cold? Absolutely. So, and that too can be a little bit difficult to tease apart sometimes. Uh, cold and flu are very similar, except flu tends to be, uh, the symptoms tend to be that much higher as far as uh, the cold-like symptoms. Uh, usually you get high-grade fever, uh, chills, body pains, uh, headaches sometimes, um, and then like Monica had mentioned, feeling really tired. Usually you're extremely run down. So think of it almost like your regular cold, but to the utmost degree. And are there things about flu that we should be more concerned about, particularly in the elderly? Absolutely. So. Um, elderly tend to be a little bit more immunocompromised, meaning that their bodies can't really handle the infection as well as it would if a younger patient. Um, the problems with influenza is that it can lead to other complications, including things like pneumonia um, or other uh, bacterial infections that get superimposed on top of the influenza virus. Panos, you mentioned that um, there are complications and it's a more serious illness. So everybody, I think, knows that we have uh, influenza vaccines. You can tell us a little bit, if you would please, about vaccinating adults and the elderly against influenza. So it's, it's recommended that everybody at this point get vaccinated against influenza. Uh, it's a good preventative measure um, to kind of protect oneself from, you know, acquiring uh, the viral infection at some point during the flu season. Um, at this point, uh, there is both a flu mist, uh, which is a uh, activated or live, to a certain degree attenuated, uh, uh, viral uh, vaccination you can get or the flu vaccine, the immunization that you get. And that's uh, basically a recombinant or inactivated viral uh, influenza immunization, if you will. 
So uh, typically it takes about two weeks to get immunity. So it's always good to get it kind of earlier in the flu season to kind of allow your body to develop the appropriate immunity against the influenza virus. Monica, how about vaccinations for kids? Yes, uh, one important thing that Pano's mentioned in regards to the elderly is that they're to a certain degree immunocompromised. And in a sense, very young children, particularly mm -hmm. infants, are also building their immune system. Um, that being said, children less than six months of age cannot receive the flu vaccine. So what I recommend in those cases, uh, like you said, I recommend for all children to get a vaccination, but for infants less than six months old, the way to protect those infants are, are to get their family members vaccinated. That would include parents, siblings, or any other close caregivers of that child um, until that child then becomes eligible at six months to receive the vaccination. Um, we do dose the vaccine a little bit differently depending on the size and age of the child, but it's very similar in terms of what Pano's described. So you use the word immunocompromised, and just so all of our listeners know, all of our viewers know, uh, that really means that people have a harder time fighting off infections, right? So here at the Palo Alto Medical Foundation in Los Gatos, we have multiple ways that patients can receive vaccinations. We have different vaccinations for children. We have a nose spray and injectables as well. For the elderly, we have a double dose vaccine. It's important that everyone get vaccinated. So we would like to make sure that all of our patients go come to our clinic or go to a pharmacy or another healthcare facility to get vaccinated. Just let your primary care doctor know that you've had it done. Here at our clinic, you can get your vaccine at a regular appointment. You can make an appointment with a nurse just to get a vaccine. You can come to our Flu Express clinic when we will give hundreds of vaccines in one day to anyone who comes in, whether you're a regular patient of our clinic or not. And then we also have a walk-in clinic for anyone in the community that runs each day starting in the month of October from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. right through the winter. Monica, could you help us understand a little bit about how we can prevent the spread of colds and flu? So uh, sneezing and cough are common symptoms uh, with colds, but they're also easy ways for uh, children or adults to spread germs, especially in environments like school or work. So one natural way that often uh, what people do is that they cover their mouths with their hands, but in <laughs> fact then they cover their hands with germs. So uh, one great strategy actually is to um, sneeze or cough into your elbow. That's often something that we model, uh, that we show children how to do uh, in the exam room. Um, or to cough or sneeze into a tissue. And I always remind um, parents and children to wash their hands immediately after. Um, show us what you mean when you say cough into your elbow. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, that would be coughing or sneezing into your elbow. <coughs> like so. <laughs> Pondus, you mentioned yes. that one of the complications of flu can be that it can turn into pneumonia. Help our viewers understand a little bit more about how they know if that could be happening, please. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, as you mentioned, pneumonia is one of the potential complications that do come about with influenza or a complicated influenza uh, infection. Uh, typically, the symptoms that people get, really bad cough, they can have some chest pain potentially in the areas where they're having the pneumonia. And then at the same time, they can get really short of breath. Um, usually fever is a lot higher, maybe in the 100, 300, 4 range at times, potentially. Um, but that's really the main stuff to look out for. If someone is really short of breath, um, or they are having some chest pain more than, you know, the normal from coughing, let's say, that's a good indicator to come in and get evaluated. How about, uh, how should our adults know when it's time to stay home from work? Well, that's a great question. I mean, a lot of people ask that too. So, uh, you know, really, if you're having fever, if you're having any of the body symptoms, the body pains, uh, you're having the chills, that's a pretty good indicator that the virus is still kind of shedding or spreading through your body. And that's when you're the most, um, let's say, infective to others. So if you've been off of uh, medications like Tylenol or Advil for about 24 hours and you're no longer having those symptoms, especially fever, that's probably a good indicator that you're able to go back to work at that point. And when we talk about fever, is there a number that you're thinking about that our patients should keep in mind? Uh, really, it's somewhere around that 103 range for adults that you really should kind of consider coming in. And how about uh, if their temperature is coming down but not completely gone, how low does it need to be before they should return to work? Really, uh, that, that's a little bit of a difficult question, but uh, really 
fever is measured at 100.8 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. So if you're under that 100 degrees, you're probably okay at that point. I'm going to discuss one exception to the case. <laughs> okay, Monica, so, help us, please. So for children, uh -huh. the fever guidelines you gave actually are truly excellent. The only additional thing I want to say is for infants less than six months, we tend to be a little bit more um, cautious, particularly if they're less than three months old. So if you have a newborn infant, um, your pediatrician would recommend that you come in for a temperature greater than 100.3 degrees. If in any doubt, ask your pediatrician, but that is just a special exception in this case. So we've talked today about fever as an indicator perhaps of more serious illness. Why do we even have a fever? So fever is actually a protective mechanism of the body. When you have um, a germ like a virus in your body, um, the body produces fever actually to help get rid of the infection. So in many ways, it's actually a very helpful mechanism that our body has to help us naturally fight infection. That being said, as anyone who's had fever knows, it can make you feel quite miserable. Um, and this is particularly true for children and of course also for adults. So it's perfectly fine um, in children to give acetaminophen or ibuprofen for fever. Um, we do tend to be more cautious in children less than six months of age. Um, if you have any questions regarding what kind of medication to give for fever, contact your doctor. So Pondos, I wanted to ask a little bit about uh, activity. Uh, we've mentioned that folks with colds and fever should get lots of rest. But particularly if it's a minor cold or, or something like that, what do you advise our adult patients about activity level, exercise, uh, and how their illness might impact that? So uh, when you do have the acute illness, you know, whether it be the cold or the flu, you, like we mentioned, I mean, you can feel pretty run down. Um, really, in order to get over the infection, you really got to allow your body a chance to kind of combat that. Um, like we mentioned, rest is very paramount. So exercise is maybe not the best idea when you're feeling a little run down at that point um, and it's probably a good idea to just kind of take it easy for at least a few days to allow the body to heal itself and both you and monica have talked about hydration or making sure that you have plenty fluid in your system when you're ill monica mentioned some things for children but what kinds of fluids should adults be taking when they're ill um, water is always the greatest thing to take uh, but fluids can come in any sort of any sort of uh, fluid that you want to take, whether it be a cola, uh, you know, something like Sprite, if you'd like. Um, any sort of juices are always good. Broths, uh, chicken broth is always a good thing that you can take. Um, and really any, any sort of hydration, whether it be like a Gatorade or Powerade, just something to just keep the fluids up in the body is always a good idea. Monica, any, you mentioned uh some things, but maybe this is a time you can expand on what would be best for sure. kids. One common question I get is, what should infants receive? And usually I encourage parents to continue giving whatever they're normally giving, whether it's breastfeeding um, or formula. Actually, that's often the most helpful. Um, as Panos mentioned, water, um, they do for children sell different kinds of hydration fluids that replenish the body's electrolytes, things like sodium and potassium. Um, those can be sold in liquid form or even in popsicle form, which can be pretty easy for kids uh, to take. So any of those are perfectly fine. I usually advise parents to check um, their children's uh, urine, um, just check how frequently they're urinating. Um, if their child hasn't urinated in their diaper or in the potty uh, in eight or more hours, that's a sign that they're likely quite dehydrated and should come in to see the doctor. We've heard uh, about the use of acetaminophen or ibuprofen to help for fever and aches and pains, those sorts of things. But how about other medicines for children? Is there anything that's uh, advisable? So this is a, a big challenge, particularly in children less than six years of age. Um, there are many over-the-counter remedies for children that are sold, um, and they generally are not safe to use in children less than six years of age. If a parent is in any doubt, uh, they should speak to their doctor about that. Um, that being said, there are many natural remedies, um, teas, honey is actually found to be very mm -hmm. helpful for cough, either given directly or mixed in tea, um, and uh, fever control, as we've already discussed with acetaminophen or ibuprofen. Then how do we keep the little one's noses clear if they can't use decongestant? That's an excellent question. Um, so especially if the child is quite small, um, we show parents how to remove the nasal secretions. Um, Parents can put drops of saline water in the nose and then use different uh, tools like a bulb syringe or some other tools 
sold in pharmacies to actually remove the, the nasal secretions. Another therapy that helps a lot is either warm or cool vapor, and parents can give that simply by sitting with their child uh, in the bathroom with the shower running uh, and the room filled with warm steam uh, and allowing their child to breathe that in. That usually helps soothe um, the nasal passages and, and help uh, get secretions out. Are there any medicines to help with congestion and other cough and cold or flu symptoms that are safe for adults to use besides acetaminophen and ibuprofen? So there are, uh, and depending on the symptoms. So with the congestion, whether it be up in the face and the sinuses or in the chest, uh, there's medicines like guaifenesin, which help to thin the mucus a little bit and allow it to kind of cough up a little bit easier. There's also uh, certain decongestants, um, pseudoephedrine in particular, um, that can help uh, transiently for short periods of time with congestion. Of course, you know, there's certain other uh, people with other let's say chronic diseases that maybe should not be using those, including people with hypertension or um, you know, males with an enlarged prostate. Um, but what other people can use are, uh, in addition to the nasal saline, which you mentioned, which is a great idea for adults, are nasal corticosteroids. So medications like Flonase or Nasacort that you may have seen on TV, over a period of a few days, tend to help with the nasal congestion and help with overall congestion. So both of you have mentioned there are some medicines that are safe to use. Uh, particularly in older children and in adults. I really appreciate that. And hopefully the viewers will understand what's safe. I think though, it sounds like we all agree that one of the best treatments for congestion is lots and lots of fluid so that people stay well hydrated and their mucus doesn't dry out, and then plenty of rest. Anything beyond acetaminophen, ibuprofen, or those things, particularly in children or older adults with uh, medical illness, as Panos has mentioned, should contact their doctor and ask questions about what's safe. Questions from our patients are always welcome. Monica, you talked about the, cold, the flu and colds being viral illnesses. A lot of folks hope that we can help them out with antibiotics to, when they're sick. Is that appropriate for colds and flu? For many colds and flus, they are caused by viruses, um, especially respiratory viruses that are common in, in the community during the winter time. Um, in the vast majority of cases, those illnesses do not require antibiotics. Um, parents often worry about that, particularly if their child has high fever. Um, and that's an important reason to come in to see your doctor. Um, some common places where you uh, might get an infection requiring an antibiotic would be, for example, an ear infection or a pneumonia. Um, that being said, um, we really, I really do recommend for parents um, to, to check in with their doctor about that, to not feel necessarily disappointed if they don't go home with antibiotics. Oftentimes, it's, it's a very good thing that we haven't identified one of these other bacterial infections. However, if their child's um, symptoms are worsening, particularly uh, with high fever, it's important to come in just to make sure that one of those infections hasn't developed as a result of the first infection. So in my practice in family medicine, a lot of times my patients say to me, that they don't want to get the flu shot because the only time they got it is the time they got the flu and were sickest. Panos, do you have any thoughts about that? How should we uh, respond to our patients who feel that way sometimes? Yeah, very true. There are a lot of people that mention that to me as well, actually. Uh, you know, getting the influenza vaccine, uh, it's like I mentioned earlier, uh, basically a recombinant uh, virus, meaning that the virus itself is not alive. It's not a live virus. So there's no way that you can actually get the flu from the flu vaccine. Having said that, your body does respond to the flu vaccine or anything else that you put in your body. So for maybe a day or two, you may have some low-grade symptoms, including maybe a low-grade fever, chills, maybe feeling a little sniffles. Um, but really, there's no way of getting influenza from the influenza vaccine. So, so I hear you're encouraging us to have everyone get the flu vaccine. Uh, be aware that there are some side effects of the vaccine itself that should be minor, yes. but not to worry about getting terribly ill from the flu vaccine. So we do know from medical research that people who get the flu shot, particularly those who get it annually, are far less likely to get influenza and maybe even colds. So Monica, Panos, thank you very much for joining me today for this episode of Health Connections from KCAT TV. We really appreciate you helping our viewers to understand more about colds and flu. It was a pleasure. Thank you for having us.